going to um, begin with um, a talk about the meetup group that I organized in New York City called Women in Machine Learning and Data Science. Um, for short, we sometimes call it WIMLDS. And what we do, our main goal is to build a welcoming and supportive community for women. Uh, we are on Twitter and Instagram at WIMLDS. And by the end of the day today, we'll be, we're very active on Twitter. We'll be hitting probably 10,000 Twitter followers. So our mission is to support and promote, our official mission is to support and promote women and gender minorities in machine learning and data science. And so I've also added an artificial intelligence because that's just a natural conduit to what comes after DS and ML. And we are open to, uh, we're inclusive to anyone. Any gender um, is welcome to join our meetup group. Um, about me, um, what Suzanne said, I'm a statistician. I've been organizing for Wimmel DS in New York for the past four years. I'm also a board member for Wimmel DS, and what that means is um, we oversee and support the global chapters around the world. And I'm also a board member of Big Apple Pie, which runs the annual Pie Gotham Conference in New York City. And um, I'm happy to add that the board of Big Apple Pie is 50% men and 50% women. Um, and another thing I do on the side is I teach Git workshops in New York City, um, and what that does is it advances, um, one of the missions I have is open source, and it advances open source accessibility. Um, so I'd really like, you know, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge O'Reilly for their support of Wimmel DS over the past four years and their commitment to diversity. Um, um, O'Reilly has community outreach to connect to women. They're really proactive in finding women speakers for all of their conferences. They offer scholarships and travel stipends, um, diversity scholarships. They've been at the forefront of code of conduct implementation. And um, one of the things that um, the O'Reilly conferences do is that every time somebody registers for a conference, they have the option to donate some money, about five or $10, to support um, inclusion-focused organizations such as Wimmel DS. And um, they've been doing it for all of their conferences, and we've been the recipients of that several times. And so, you know, really want to thank them for that. And also for organizing this diversity luncheon, which um, is, you know, they have it at Strata and all these other conferences. So um, it's not something that I often see with other conference conferences. Okay, and so back to Wimmel DS. Wimmel DS was founded in December 2013 in San Francisco. Um, we now have, it's about five and a half years since its founding, we now have 63 chapters in 27 countries. Uh, we have 29,000 members, um, 30,000 if we count our members on Facebook, because some groups use Facebook more than Meetup. Um, our board is all US based because the first two chapters are New York and San Francisco, and um, we have 130 organizers that organize events around the world. Um, and so our community is, is our board, it's the organizers, it's our members, it's the sponsors, it's the companies that help host our events. And we really wanna thank everybody, including our supporters on social media. And because of our expansion um, around the world, our next step is to establish an ISC, which is an infrastructure steering committee, so we can involve organizers around the world to really have a say in how Wimmel DS moves forward. Okay, and so the Q1 report was just released um, last Friday, and um, we are, again, 27 countries, and um, from this map, we have two chapters in Australia, we have one in Tokyo, Philippines. India has eight chapters. Africa has two, four, six, seven chapters, including Mauritius, Egypt. The Middle East has three. Europe is a big, a big place for chapters. North, uh, the U.S. has 18, um, 18, 18 chapters. Canada has six, and South America has four. At the, these slides are gonna be made available, so at the end of the slide, I have a link to our Q1 report that has much more detailed information about where our chapters are. Okay, and this, goes, this shows the growth. Um, in 2013, it was the Bay Area chapter. 2014, it was New York. Nothing happened in 2015, and then you can see that we, had 20, we added seven chapters in 2016, five in 2017, and then the last two years have just seen tremendous growth. Um, in terms of events, um, this is um, 
14, 15. In 2018, we had 184 events organized by our chapters around the world. And you can see here, this is 2019. It's only April right now, right? Mid-April, and we already have 94 events that have been organized. Okay. And so, you know, what are these events that we organize? Um, so some, one of the things is that we want to feature women. It's not exclusively women speakers, but we do want to um, highlight women and have women be more positions of speaking at our events. Um, if there's a panel discussion, we require that at least 50% of the panelists are women. Uh, and other events that we do is we have workshops in Python, R, TensorFlow, Probability, we have open source sprints, we have career workshops, code and coffee, hackathons, and those are just some examples of the types of events that we have to advance our mission. Um, we also have a job board on our website that anyone can post jobs for free, and so that really, you know, for companies who are looking to um, have a more diverse and inclusive workforce, that's a place where um, jobs can be posted. Okay. So one of the things that um, I want to talk about is the open source initiative that we have. Um, you know, we know that in tech, um, the percentage of women that work in tech is quite low. Um, and so when we, when we go and discuss open source, particip women participate, it's really low, it's only 11%. And then when we move on to um, Python, it's only 2%. And then, um, for people who are not familiar with Scikit-Learn, it's the machine learning library for Python, that rate is even lower. It's 1%, it's actually less than 1% because the one woman contributor that's in the top 100 is not, is not is involved anymore, so there's actually no women involved. And so, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, about the open source sprints that we've had, and what they are is it's an all-day Saturday event um, Scikit-Learn is a library on GitHub because it's open source and it has over a thousand open issues. And so what we've done is in March, the, the first open source sprint was organized in March. The second was in September of 2018 and there are three more sprints that I am working on organizing for this year. There's gonna be a third one in August which is gonna be, um, it, it's in New York. And there's also one being organized in Nairobi, Kenya, which has um, been a lot of fun. It's really been eye-opening. It's also been challenging. Um, one of the reasons that I am organizing the Open Source Sprint in Nairobi, Kenya, is it's our fourth largest chapter with 2,200 plus members. So it seems reasonable that they should have the opportunity to have an Open Source Sprint, um, but it's also a different region with um, you know, different um, resources available. And for the first time, we are having an open source sprint in San Francisco, which is our first chapter and also our largest chapter. And um, as an aside, we are looking for sponsors for these events, and what that entails is providing space, providing food, and there are actually, for the hundreds of thousands of people that use the Scikit-Learn library, there aren't actually that many active contributors to the library, probably 20. And so we need a contributor to fly to the locations to facilitate the sprint, and so that is part of the um, cost that's associated with running an open source sprint. Okay. And so um, now I'm gonna speak about um, what other um, initiatives that we can do to improve uh, diversity as a community. Um, and so we all have probably heard the story that, you know, you know, men apply for a job if they feel 50% qualified, whereas women wait until they're about 90% feeling qualified. And so if, you know, if um, diversity is an initiative for you, one of the things that we can consider doing is rewriting job descriptions. Um, the other thing is we know from data that is being published out there in the tech world that women ask for raises and promotions less often than men. So another way to advance women in the industry is to Change, change the game before and be an advocate for them. Um, and as an as a example, at my last job, one of the managers there, who I did not report to directly, but had, some, had another statistician reporting to her and actually advocated a pay raise for her because at that level she knew that the women were underpaid at that, so she advocated for that and then also you know, encouraged me to, to go and ask for the raise, which I did and I received. And, um, wouldn't have done that if it hadn't been for her. Um, and the other thing that I would say is let we, women speak in general and also to amplify their voices at meetings. And so what else can we do? I think that if you follow our Twitter account, um, 
there's this um, hashtag, no mantles. And what exactly is a mantle? For people who are not sure what a mantle is, um, a panel discussion, which is um, oftentimes we see in tech, it's all men. OK. And so I think the first um, step in that is to be aware that, oh, here's a panel which is completely homogeneous, and how can we make it diverse? Um, so one thing is, first thing is just being aware. And if you are in the fortunate position to be invited um, to speak on a panel, just be aware, like, who else is speaking? You know, what are the, who are the other speakers? Is it diverse? Um, I think it's also important to, to be aware that pr progress and careers and opportunities also take place outside of the workplace. Um, so it's not just what happens at the desk or at a meeting. It's, it's the socialization that goes on outside. And all I would say is just to be aware of that. Um, and to mentor and sponsor um, employees from underrepresented groups. And finally, you know, something that's really important is a code of conduct is what we hear, but it's also, you know, the mission and the rules and the legalities of a corporation. We know that they're there. Um, I think we also know that sometimes they're not always, they're there in writing, maybe they're not always implemented, and I think it's important that um, we create a safe and welcoming environment for all people by actually um, implementing a code of conduct. And uh, the last slide in terms of what we can do is to have the difficult conversations that if there's something that's happening that is uncomfortable to be able to speak to someone and talk about it. I actually had an interaction with somebody in, um, in open source community where I thought the person was not being particularly professional and um, nice. And so um, I gave the feedback, which was a defensive response. And before we had a longer conversation, I took out my Crucial Conversations book, which I read last summer. I read it again and then had the conversation. So it's not easy to have these conversations. Um, but you know there are resources out there um, that can help. Um, the other thing is survey. So um, you know we talk about diversity, and it's like how do we measure diversity? Um, we we have to have measurements, right? There's a saying out there: we cannot understand what we cannot measure. Um, I'm also a statistician, so I'm pretty big on numbers too. Um, but if we don't have the data over time to see how things are happening, then it's difficult to assess what we're doing and what the improvements are. And so what I would say is I know that, you know, with O'Reilly, this conference, they ask an optional question at the end, you know, what is your gender? Um, and this is something that's been eye-opening for me. In the past, I would maybe not fill out a survey thinking, ah, oh, another survey. Um, but understanding what the greater implications of that are, I, um, I am much more cognizant of it. So, um, you know, if you can, like, in terms of gender diversity, to fill out those surveys, it's helpful. Um, you know, one of the discussions that's happening in data science is they don't necessarily know, for instance, in open source, they don't know exactly how many, what the gender breakdown is of men and women. So they look at avatars and names and, um, make estimates, and then there's, then there's criticism saying, this is not accurate, you can't use that, right? But there's actually no data. Um, so, you know, as a stats person, I would say we start with something, we start with the baseline and learn from that. Um, but if you can contribute to accurate data, um, please consider the reason why it's being collected, even though it may be um, a sensitive issue. Okay. And so some final thoughts that I have about it is I know sometimes people, you know, one of the questions that people ask is, I'm not, a, I'm not sure what to do. I'm not sure how to support. I, you know, I, I might make a mistake. I might say the wrong thing. And one of the things I want to share is even as a group focused on supporting women um, that is over five years old, we are learning a lot that, um, that you'd be surprised. You know, we used to call it women and non-binary, and somebody on Twitter pointed out, listen, when you say that, you've just excluded trans, trans men, because they're not non-binary. They identify as men, but they are a minority. And so we have changed our nomenclature to women and gender minorities in terms of who we're highlighting. 
Um, the other thing I would say is for Wimble DS is we implemented a code of conduct less than two years ago, and these codes of conduct have been around for much longer. Um, there were some behaviors that went on in our meetup group, which we continued, I would say, for a little too long. And so, you know, we're, I would say we're a bit behind, and I'm glad that, you know, it's implemented. And another example is um, of our Riyadh chapter. So we, as I said, you know, we have 24 new chapters just in Q1 of 2019. And so our process is somebody inquires about beginning a chapter. We send them a link to our starter kit and ask them to agree to our terms, which is its non-commercial agenda. We, we organize at least one event every six months and that. And so people write back and they agree to the terms and then we write back and say, okay, do you wanna send us your photo and a bio which we can add to our website. So our organizer for the Riyadh Saudi Arabia chapter wrote back and said, um, I can't send you a photo because I wear a veil. Is it okay if I send you an icon? And we're like, yes, sure. But you know, this is like an example of our baseline is of course, you, you know, we just expect people to send a photo without consideration. And so um, we learn to, you know, we, we're learning along the way. Um, and so, um, and then the last that I had about, my comment about the pie will get bigger is, um, you know, for, for if there is any concern that, oh, if I support diversity, that there will be less for this one group and more for another. We know that having, particularly in the United States with such a heterogeneous society, that having more people involved only makes the pie bigger. So um, to consider that. Um, and so what, I have some calls for action. The first is if you'd like to sponsor Women in Machine Learning and Data Science, um, you can post jobs on our job board so it can reach those um, 30,000 members and it's available to the public so it reaches people who are not even our members, that's fine. Um, follow us on social media. Um, if your city doesn't have a Women DS chapter, um, you can be on one. I'm actually at that table over there, we have three other organizers, two from Wimble DS and one from Pi Ladies. So if you have any questions about our meetup groups in general, about how to start a chapter or anything else, we're over there um, after the presentation, so feel free to stop by. And, you know, even outside of my organization, if you run any organization, whether it's, uh, you know, if it's a, a baseball group or a soccer group or a tennis group or a church group or anything, um, consider that a code of conduct is really, really helpful for, um, you know, sort of watching behavior and creating this environment that's, cre uh, that's inclusive and diverse. Um, I know with my meetup group for years we didn't have a code of conduct. I observed behavior that I didn't think was appropriate, but I didn't know how to address it. And then once the code of conduct was implemented, it was very easy to say, oh yes, this, this is really not in alignment with our code of conduct, so it was very helpful. Um, so again, you know, we're over at this table. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, the slides are available, so the Q1 report in more detail is available. There's an article I wrote about code of conduct also available. And for Wimmel DS, our Twitter, again, is at Wimmel DS, website, WimmelDS.org, and our email is info at WimmelDS.org. And for me, my Twitter is Reshma S. I have a website with um, actually some, a lot of articles that um, will be helpful to the community, and my email is available. And I will leave that up there. And we do have some time set aside for Q&A, so if anybody has any questions, um, I'm happy to take them. Or we could keep eating lunch. <laughs> <laughs>